It's Bronze and Modern Gods. I'm John. I have coffee. I'm Richard, and I already drank my coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay. Good for you. Hey, welcome, everybody. If you are not following us on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods, follow us on Bronze and Modern Gods. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. You guys know the deal. If you're not new to YouTube, you've been here before. Why do I have to say these things every week, Richard? Because you want them to slap that like button. Uh, Okay. Uh, We have... A lot of viewer mail today. Uh, You guys love to send us uh, letters and emails, and uh, we haven't gotten any snail. Well, no, I take that back. We have gotten snail mail, haven't we? Um, Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. Uh, What's wrong with you people? What year is this? Um, We also have our underrated books of the week. We've got 25-year rule. Let's start off with our hot book of the week. Richard, were you at D23 in Anaheim this weekend? I was not. I, I did follow the uh, the live feed for it, but uh, oh. Marvel Spotlight number two is our hot book of the week. This is the first appearance of Werewolf by Night. Um, this Jack, book has been an awesome. Jack, Pardon? Jack Russell. Yeah. <laughs> I, Jack did, you, Russell. Did, did you see, I mean, did you see the, uh, they're going with a horror theme for, for uh. this particular uh i loved it we'll get to we'll get to d23 in a second let's talk about this okay. book first of all um this book has been an upward tra- tra- uh, trajectory ever since 2020 when rumors about werewolf uh by night the project started swirling around and uh now we know we have an official announcement now with d23 but you know we i'm looking at the gpa for not just the high grades which have you know been where oh. they are but like some lower grades has actually kind of gone down a bit i think that's the overall trend in the market right now so some good deals out there however we just had a sale of a 9.6 this month for twelve thousand dollars that is down believe it really? or not from a sale last year for fourteen thousand and one dollar I love that someone sniped that for one dollar. <laughs> That's why if you go back to our our auction tips video where we tell you to bid odd numbers. It's yeah. still nicely up from twenty twenty where it was sold for thirty eight eighty. So I would say if I paid three thousand eight hundred eighty dollars for that book and I got twelve k for it two years later, take that, Susie Orman. I'm I'm actually surprised this book is as popular as it as it is. Um, you know, this tells you that that horror genre has an, an audience and a following. I can tell you part of it. Um, this book has always been tough in high grade. It is uh, early square bound Marvel. It has that red border around it, that Marvel picture frame border with that red that picks up every every imperfection, every flake. And no one cared about this book for how many years, Richard? I mean, how many dollar bins did you see Werewolf by Night I sitting know, in? Oh, I know. That's why these books, they shoot up because the high grade specimens are really scarce. Now, I want to remind people the real reason why you should have this book, there's a Venus reprint by Bill Everett inside. That is another that is another positive for this book. That I have a 7.5 slab that I bought merely because it has the Venus gargoyles story in it, which is a classic. And uh, I didn't want to read my my then copy of Venus. Uh, I think it's 15 that the original book. Uh, I didn't want to crack it open. So I bought that to read as my reader. Um, all right. So we're into it. Werewolf by Night, one of the announcements at D23. As you mentioned, the trailer, I think it looks fun. It's hysterical, super campy. Nice black and white. And, you know, I, I think it's going to be it's going to be something good. Uh, I have I have confidence in Marvel. Um, so, yeah, well, D23 was inform, informative and also disappointing in the lack of information they provided. So, um, you know, they're they're letting imaginations run wild, which isn't a bad thing. But I would have loved to have more concrete information on some of these properties as they, as they're coming up. Um, Werewolf by night trailer. That was man thing, correct? Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. Good. Get your fear tens people. Uh, get your, yep. you know, Savage tales. One is out of reach now. If you haven't gotten it already. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, all right. So let's go. Even though not a lot was revealed for some of the future products projects. Mm-hmm. I do think I was surprised to see a full trailer for secret invasion. I was not expecting that. I, I I wasn't either. I'm glad Samuel L. Jackson is is uh, reprising his role uh, for for a movie about or a show about scrolls. There sure weren't a lot of scrolls in that trailer, 
I think they're really trying to downplay that here and before the actual show comes out to kind of to build the suspense as the individual uh, episodes come out. But yeah, buy buy your Fantastic Four number number twos if you can find them. I saw plenty of scrolls. They just weren't in their normal form. Right, right, (laughs) right. What total invasion of the body snatchers vibe I got from that. It looked yep. real, you know, people complaining, which I don't get about, you know, the comedic nature of She-Hulk. Have you guys read She-Hulk? Um, can you stop being stupid for like half a second? It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be a comedy. So Come maybe, on, a, jump, a naked jump rope issue. It, it, it's you it's can, fun. You can tell it's the people who actually don't read the comic books that are, are whining the most about, oh, she twerked. <gasps> oh, clutch my pearls, Betsy. How dare she? Um, Secret Invasion should shut you all the hell up. Uh, it looks really intense. It looks like it's deadly serious. So, you know, quit whining. Uh, now, if you're whining because She-Hulk isn't funny, um, I, I suggest you watch Thursday's episode. I laughed throughout for the first time. Admittedly, uh, it was the first time I laughed out loud throughout an episode of She-Hulk. I thought it was great. I think it's great. Uh, my wife and I, this is something we can watch together, and she enjoys it as much as I do. I think, you know, she and I were talking about how Marvel is expanding their demographics. First with Ms. Marvel approaching a younger audience, and now with She-Hulk, um, you know, attracting female viewers. I think it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, the more people who see these movies, the more the more value we get out of our comics. <laughs> it's Madison with a Y, but not where you think. Oh, I love that. I mean, that was I, we, awesome. When are we seeing the Madison uh, miniseries? That's what I want to know. Uh, more serious, uh, more serious topics. Armor Wars with uh, uh, James John Rhodes Cheadle. in the lead. Mm-hmm. John Cheadle. Um, I, that'll be interesting. I hope we see things like the Guardian armor and yeah. Yeah, you know all the other things besides the the Stark tech. Yeah, no, Tony. It's going to be interesting to see how they pull off Armor Wars without Tony Stark as kind of a, a vehicle in that. Yeah, but you know what I was the most excited about? We got to see the Thunderbolts. I know. I thought of. I thought of you. <laughs> Actually, I thought of you and and our mutual friend Evan. When, when this I particular- love it. The new Black Widow. You've got Winter Soldier. You've got the Red Guardian. U.S. Agent. The Ghost. Taskmaster. It's not the Thunderbolts. Every single one of those characters, with I think the exception of the Red Guardian, has been a Thunderbolt in the mm-hmm. comics. So, once again, shut up, people, if you don't read the books. Um, oh, I yeah. Think it's wonderful how they introduced all these characters, kind of, you know, as, you know, side projects in all these different uh, movies over, over time, TV shows over time. And all of a sudden, they brought them all together. Again, Marvel has a long term. Almost vision. like it was planned, Richard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, I forgot to mention my favorite member of the new Thunderbolts, Elaine Bennis from Seinfeld. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Julie Louis Dreyfus is. Uh, so she's there as well. So uh, super excited about Thunderbolts. Uh, again, I think Hulk, uh, Incredible Hulk 449 has seen some ups and downs. I'm not sure where it's at right now. If you don't have one, maybe grab it. Right, but and, uh, all these the first appearance. I, I know the Taskmaster's uh, first appearance, Avengers. I can't remember the number for one ninety eight. I think. Yeah, I, th- I believe you're right. Are you, uh, everybody uh, in the comments is screaming right now at us. <laughs> uh, it's taken a, it took a major plunge after um, uh, Taskmaster's appearance in uh, Black Widow, but I I, th- I think. Um, it's an opportunity. You know, I, hope, yeah. I hope people held on to their books because I see them uh, actually spiking again. Here is what I need to do. I have homework. I'm halfway through the Sandman. I'm caught up to She-Hulk. I have not seen Black Widow. I have not seen Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. And I have not seen Love and Thunder. Okay. So I, I have a lot a of homework to do. A little bit better than you. I, I've, I, have, I have not seen saw the first three ish episodes of um, Sand, Sandman. I have not seen Love and Thunder yet. Mm. Anything else I'm caught up on. Before everybody in the comments gets on me, yes, I know about the end of Love, Love and Thunder. I may skip right to it first and see that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I will see it uh, sometime this century. Yeah, it's, it's, kind of sor- it's kind of sad that a major Marvel uh, movie release just really hasn't drawn me to, to watch it. Even, you know, on on disney plus 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, phase four is not as exciting as the first phases. Admittedly, it's it's a different uh, different uh, variety of tone and, and things. But, you know, sometimes you want Steve Rogers. Sometimes you want Tony Stark. Y'all By the way, it's issue number. Oh, you got it on your shirt. 196. <laughs> <laughs> Show everybody your shirt. <laughs> There's the first appearance of the Taskmaster. If only we had some reference nearby oh, when, when we mentioned it earlier. <sighs> okay. Yeah, it's a good thing you're pretty, Richard, because... Uh, hey, everybody, it's time for your favorite segment in ours, Viewer Mail. You've got mail. Our first piece of Viewer Mail comes to us at our email address, bronzeofmoderngods at gmail.com, from James Williams, who writes, Hello, gentlemen. I ran across this auction at Comic Connect. It is a Captain Marvel Jr. issue from 1945, graded a CGC 9.9. I know. I saw that. It was just... Oh, so am I supposed to believe that 99.99% of modern books are graded no higher than a 9.8, but a book from 77 years ago was able to get a 9.9? How is this even possible? Well, is it possible? Number one. Number two... Uh, James, I don't know if you noticed, it is a double cover, so that really helps because the rules for CGC grading is the, the, the posted grade in that corner is the grade of the inside cover, not the outer wrap. So the first cover was graded a 9.8, uh -huh. even with a big old honking dust shadow along the right-hand side. I just want to point that out to everybody. Do you all see that right there, a little dust shadow, 9.8? Um, the second cover got a 9.9. .9. So, in the realm of weirdo possibilities, there is a chance that that interior cover, and let's not forget, all of the pages inside as well, were so newsstand, minty, fresh, right off the printer that this book earned a 9.9. .9. Is it really? No. Um, it is the Edgar Church Mile High copy. There's that. It is a pedigree. This now stands as the highest graded Golden Age comic book in existence. However, the auction on Comic Connect is currently at $5,300 with three days left to go. Does that seem low to you, Richard? Oh, it's hugely low. I, 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 it's very low. And um, I think people are calling bullshit on this. I'm sorry. Can I say bullshit on right now? Uh, you, can, you did. Let's see what happens with our monetization. <laughs> okay. Um, it, yeah, there's there is unless this book has been sitting in an argon tank for the last 50 some odd hundred. How many years that is? Uh, 77. Uh, 77. <laughs> and, unless it's been in an environment that argon. is. Argon. Yeah, some inert <laughs> gas that doesn't, you know, the pages won't react to the. We're such <laughs> nerds. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's just no way that this book can 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 qualify the, from page quality and the cover as a 9.9. .9. This is definitely graded on a curve, and I, I think it speaks to an agenda that CGC has to bringing these newsworthy stories to the market. They want people to see, oh, wow, this book came to the market as a CGC book. That is more important to them than the fact that they grade the book in a, in a reasonable uh, manner. 9.8, maybe. I could see the, the not, situation. Not with up. the dust shadow. Not with the dust shadow, but you see the inner cover, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but there are so many modern books that are that are literally come off of the press, go directly to the grading houses, that never achieve a nine point eight. There's I I just don't see a physical way how this book uh, can can achieve the same kind of grade that a book that is purpose made to be graded nine point eight can't get a nine point nine. Uh I'd love to be proven wrong, but I have a very uh, strong suspicion that if someone named Richard Brown from Strongsville, Ohio, had submitted this book, it would not have the same grade it has right now. All right, Richard, what is your first piece of view of mail? My first piece is from Beer Marshall. And I, I apologize, Beer Marshall. Uh, you wrote a rather lengthy post, and I wish I could read it all, but uh, in the interest of time in the show, I'm going to read the part that... Uh, I think is relevant to the conversation. Still, still is a great post. If you have an opportunity, look on uh, the YouTube channel and read it in, in its entirety. Uh, another enjoyable show. Uh, thank you very much. 
I think there's a bit of inconsistent, inconsistency here, though, guys, between your letting CGC off the hook for destroying 700 copies of a book. Who let him off the hook? That's I, I was. Look okay. at the thumbnail. <laughs> CGC is destroying comic books. It says it right on the thumbnail. And then turning around and slamming a guy for ripping apart an AF-15. Both are destroying comics for the reasons that amount to dollars. Yes, they do. They, they are. And you boil it down. I don't see the difference, frankly. At least it seemed inconsistent to me in the way you discussed it. But maybe my hearing, my brains are just off. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i old like you two. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, what I'm doing anymore. Uh, you go first. <laughs> All right, this is interesting. Uh, I, I don't remember us letting them off the hook. Um, I do know that the intent of this book was to get a certain number, 300, 9.8. The book was printed with that intent. So the destruction of the book, uh, the other 700 copies, was a part of this run. Yeah. They were trying to get 9.8. Anything else that over those 9.8 that they originally decided upon were going to be destroyed. Um, here's a here's a little insider news. They always print extra books, even if they have 300. There's always books that are a part of uh, what they consider. Um, it's an overrun for damages. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yes, we will see probably at some point if this takes off, we'll see some raw books that are a part of that overrun. But that's a whole another story. So yeah, yeah, I I think that that's the reason why I I may. I may not be as upset about this the 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 700 books being destroyed. The AF15 is taking a book and literally ripping it to pieces because the individual pages amount to more value than the book as in its uh, entire. Don't it call it a book. This is taking a historic document that yeah. is 60 years old this year and destroying it. As opposed to, I printed up a thousand of these yesterday at World Color, and now I'm going to have CGC burn up 700 of them. Right. There is a difference. Sorry, there is a difference, and I think you know I was thinking about this, and I think there's there's a partial solution to this. If CGC for page, you know, when when you grade an indiv individual page from a book or the cover um, for an individual page, you get a PG for the grade, and if you get a cover like the cover is uh, AF15, you get a CVR in in, in the grade. If they, instead of making those blue label, made them a completely different cover, color, um, I think that would um, that would help differentiate them from individual graded comics. Blood red. Yeah, absolutely. Like, stop. Uh, <laughs> Beer Marshall, uh, we, we love you. We love your questions. We're old like you. And uh, yes, we, we were not, def I don't think we were defending CGC at all. In fact, we were a little appalled that they would be a part of this uh, thing. Uh, and conflict of interest is in the thumbnail as well. So <laughs> along these lines, I got an email at bronzeandmoderngods at gmail.com from PK Zor, who says, re-slabbing individual comic pages. I agree it's not an ideal practice, but it is really not far behind the practice of slabbing comic books in general. It is easier to accept slabbing when it comes to sports cards because the owner still can see the entire item in question. With comics, I think there are plenty of key individual pages, first appearances, splashes, reveals, beautiful art, which would be fun to see versus just having the cover as proof that you have the comic in question. Thanks for hearing this opinion. Cheers. Yeah, uh, PK, um, thank you for sharing that. It is a point. I was going to say it's a valid point. I don't know if it's... I don't want to, I don't know. Um, I still don't want to destroy a book because you want to display the last page of Hulk 181 where Wolverine's jumping out, you know, or, or sorry, Hulk 180, the cameo, wink, wink. Um, yeah. Maybe it is worth destroying that book. <laughs> don't destroy 181. I see what you're saying, though. You know, if, if you really want that image, here is what I recommend. Go on to... Marvel Unlimited, or get a digital copy, get a high-res printout in color from FedEx Kinko's, and put it on your wall. Please, don't destroy a book. Yeah, I. but we're old, we're old fuddy-duddies. Um, <laughs> Granted. Yeah, no, I agree with you, but I guess it depends on what you're collecting. Are you collecting moments from comics, or are you collecting comics themselves? 
So if you're collecting comics themselves, you don't want to see them destroyed because they are they are um, archival documents, and you want to preserve those archival documents as to the best of your ability. And that typically means slabbing them because slabbing them does pr- pr- protect them from the environment somewhat. They're not airproof at all, at all, but it does protect them. And if that's your goal, then that's great. If you're instead, and you're not a comic book fan, but you're a fan of comic art or, um, you know, as he mentions, you know, individual scenes, then, you know, maybe it's more valuable for you to display those and, you you know, you'll cut them out of a comic and, and do that. That's fine. It's just realize that if you come across a comic collector, they won't necessarily want to buy your your type of collection. Um Unless, of course, it's like AF15 and it's a single page, you know, there's always somebody who's going to be attracted to that. But you know, no, I think it's two different kinds of collecting, and I think they're both valid. It's just the kind of collecting I do, I preserve the book. And that's, I, I just don't want to rip out the, for example, the jump rope uh, pages out of uh, She-Hulk uh, 40. That's, that's just not what I want to do. Let me take a stand. I don't think it's valid. I don't, okay. I don't think ripping a, a book apart and getting individual pages is a valid form of collecting. It is cashy grabby. Um, you know, even though PK Zor has a point, you have baseball cards, you see both sides, and he wants to see the inside of the book. Don't destroy a book, please. I'm begging you. Don't do it. No. Again, we, we, we are collectors, and that's this is something that we won't do. What is your next piece of your mail? My next piece of viewer mail is from Holden Humphreys. Um, I predict that some of the copies that are supposed to be destroyed are, are destroyed are hidden away and will resurface at some point in the future. Uh, yeah, as, as we mentioned earlier, there there are um, some copies that are pr- pr- uh, above and beyond for over uh, an overrun. Some of them are used for archival purposes. Some of them are used uh, for promotional purposes. But there's always seems to be additional copies. Now, I have seen CGC and CBCS state very equivocally, unequivocally, I should say, that all copies have been destroyed. Um, CBCS did a, a Wolverine number one a couple years ago where they limited to 181 copies and they claimed to, to destroy every single one of the other copies of that run besides those that were graded 9.8s. Um, you know, you have to take them for their word, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if some show up at some point that aren't slabbed that are part of that overrun. I don't know. If I was Nelson at Big Time Collectibles, I would do my damnedest to make sure they didn't because it's your reputation on the line, yeah. and, and he seems like a good sort. Uh, so if some do surface, I don't know if they would come from him. Maybe some fell off the truck on the way to Sarasota. Who knows? I don't think it'll come from him, but you know the the presses just don't stop at 181 copies. No, you know no. they're going to print additional ones. Yeah, like I said, some some fell into a box somewhere. Who knows? Uh, my final piece of viewer mail for this week comes from E R S R S. I found a really decent copy of 13 number six from Dell Comics at a swap meet Saturday. I never right. even knew this comic existed until I found it. I figured John would be a fan of this book. There were 29 issues in total, and it would be really cheap to collect the entire series. Yes, ER 13, subtitled Going on 18, was uh, a a strange on-again, off-again series from Dell that ran like 10 years, uh, from 61 to 71. Uh, It was drawn by the same guy who did a comic strip called Ponytail, which was about a teenage girl who had a ponytail. Imagine that, Richard. (laughs) <laughs> well, what a leap. And it's about, you know, kind of an Archie-esque teen girl, 13, and her misadventures. And, you know, she's at the dance with her best friend and all that kind of stuff. As you can see from the cover here, lighthearted teen fun. I don't collect this, though, ER. Number one, I really don't do Dell. The only Dells I really do are some of the Tarzan photo covers. And maybe if I see a really nice copy of Dr. Solar, Man of the Atom, I'll pick that up. But I've never really been into Dells. Um, and it's not cheesecakey enough for me to be interested, like Millie and Chili and Patsy, and it, 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 it doesn't have that Marvel branding, which I'm such a Marvel nerd. So, yeah, I understand why you would think I would be into 13, going on 18. Uh, 
it sounds really pervy also in today's times. <laughs> I, I never thought of that. Yeah, it kind of does. Uh, but yes, but thank you for the, the email because it reminded me of this book. And I don't think I've ever seen one in the wild. It just, I don't think people bring it to shows. So interesting uh, email. What is your last piece of viewer mail? Okay, my, my last piece of viewer mail is from James Creed. Uh, I don't do CGC anyway. Uh, so this is just an out for, as an outside observer. Do you think CGC should grade single pages as single page green label qualified or as comic book art? Obviously, they could hurt their bottom line, so they probably wouldn't. But a green label would definitely detract scavengers from harvesting single pages. I love that scavengers from harvesting. I love that for that phrasing. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I I I don't think they should be graded as blue label. Uh, green label seems to make sense to me since green label indicates there's something missing from uh, a book and there's definitely something missing there's only one page um so indicating that there is an incomplete book by having a green label makes total sense to me and it does i think it would it would slow down people from um you, you know splitting a book into individual pages if they didn't get that blue label so I totally hope that they would do that. Um, but like you say, it, it would affect their bottom line not and not necessarily uh, improve. While it would improve the hobby, I think uh, financially they would get less submissions. And so, you know, CGC seems to be driven by money recently. So, Do you think right. it would matter? I mean, it's got a big NG on it. Yeah, but just still a blue label. You know how people are. You, you go through your collection, blue, 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 green. And that that stands out. And that's something that's going to be a detraction from your collection. Here's my suggestion. Make it purple. You have yeah. you have altered the book from its original state. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there you go. It's trimming. You've trimmed the book. PG. Yeah, it's out to one page. <laughs> it is. It's it's not a complete book. I, I don't think it, it deserves uh, either the individual page or the cover. Uh, I don't think they deserve a blue label. I think they deserve uh, a, a different color or some other way of signifying that it is not a, a, a complete book or even a partial book, really. We've gone back and forth between destroying old books for single pages to uh, slabbing and destroying remainder copies, the ones that don't get a 9.8, to 13 going on 18 from Dell Comics all in one eh, beard hair, all in one viewer mail segment. <laughs> this was going to be a segue into the 25 the 25 year, year <laughs> But the beard oh, hair threw me. The dangers of having a scraggly old beard. Hey, the 25-year rule this week looks at another Dell comic alum. This one is Turok and Turok Spring Break in the Lost Land from Acclaim slash Valiant Comics. That's the face I want to see, Richard, right there. What the hell? Uh, this was a one shot in a series of Turok one shots that continued through 1998 after Turok lost his own ongoing series from Valiant. But Acclaim was famous for making video games, bought a Valiant, had a really successful Turok video game. So they had to keep that property alive. Somehow these one shots fit the bill. Now Turok Spring Break in the Lost Land, right down to that goofy cover, seemed a little out of character for Turok. But what do I know? I had read Turok since the 1970s when he was running around in a loincloth with his little brother or whatever he was, killing dinosaurs with a bow and arrow. Um, this is very 90s to the extreme. I'm so, I'm surprised they're not drinking Mountain Dew on the cover and uh, skateboarding or uh, Poochie is there uh, with Itchy and Scratchy to bring it you know, more into the extreme. I'm going to give this the benefit of the doubt, though, because it was written by Fabian Nicenza who can pretty much do no wrong in my book as a writer. He's a really talented writer, so I'm sure it's not as cringe as the cover is. You can find out for yourself for a whole $2 on eBay if you really want to know. Now, here's my question to you, Richard, and to everyone else watching this podcast or listening to it on your favorite podcast platform. How many copies of Turok number 1 from 1992 
do you see on average during your comic book hunting with that chromium cover? I, I have to say, I haven't seen any recently. Wow. I used to see boxes and boxes of this book. I, I don't know if it's the the um, the the boxes that I'm going through. I typically don't go through quarter boxes anymore just because I'm, that's not what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So if they're in there, then I, I haven't come across them. But dollar bin boxes, I do go through, and I haven't seen it. Wow. How about you guys? How many Turoks do you have in your collection? Uh, that chromium cover. I remember again. I had I was managing the shop when it came out, and I think we got two cases of them, so seven hundred copies. And I believe we sold a good eighty percent of those the first week. Uh, Valiant was was blazing hot, and I think either this, I think this was before Exo Manowar. That was the first chromium cover they had done, so people were really into it. Uh, boy, boy, what were we thinking? Hey. Underrated books of the week. Richard, hit us. My underrated pick this week is uh, House of X on uh, number one and its sister book, uh, Powers of X, number one. Um, these are X-Men books. This is the basically the reboot of the X-Men uh, by Jonathan Hickman. And I have to say it was a stunner. Uh, it, it took the X-Men in a direction that I did not expect, it, but I totally bought into uh, basically, P P Professor X, he had it with this trying to coexist with humans thing. And he moved towards Magneto's view of the world where mutants were a separate power. And they basically established their own country and they're uh, a base on, on Mars. And there's, it's a very, very intriguing storyline because it takes place in three different timelines. Uh, and following, this, the, following mutants through those three different timelines and... Um, I'm not going to spoil. If you haven't read it, definitely do read it. Um, Maury McTaggart has a has a hugely important role in this. Uh, it was a great story. It's a six six books um, miniseries, limited series, definitely worth getting. And I think this has a potential of being um, you know a modern classic. You know they've already reprinted it as a graphic novel. I think there are opportunities to pick this book up book up really inexpensively and uh, for House of uh, House of X. 9.8, you know, the, the first print, 71 bucks. There is a Virgin uh, Brooks uh, variant that still is only uh, 250 bucks, bucks for a 9.8. Uh, and the census is pretty light, 220 on the census for the first print. Uh, there's a fourth print that only has three books graded. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to pick this book up cheap. You know, it's still a recent book, but, you know, and to me it has the same kind of vibe as the days and future past books you know x-men uh 141 um and 142 i think it still has that that has that same kind of potential and uh you know this is an opportunity to pick them up while no one else is really paying attention to i love the allegory um by that i mean you know the, the x-men have always stood in for uh minorities or people that have been picked on or historically been outcasts so they're tired of coexistence so they're going to move to the castro <laughs> or atlanta if you prefer <laughs> so, mm -hmm. it's funny just the whole allegory this is a book we've talked about before on the podcast where every time it comes up i say i promise i'm going to read the hickman run so let me again say i promise i'm going to read the hickman run but that becomes uh next on the list after i finish rereading my underrated series this week not a book crossfire this was a spinoff from the 80s indie comic d and agents now while it had superhero superhero origins dealing with a bail bondsman named jay endicott who inherits the costume of an underworld hitman it really was more about the seedy underbelly of hollywood and the entertainment industry something i'm close to here that's because it was written by Mark Evanier, who has spent decades writing not only comics, but tons and tons of TV shows. It also features beautiful art by Dan Spiegel, who you may know from years of drawing before Dell Comics. This is the Dell Comics episode. Most notably, Space Family Robinson, which uh, was ripped off for Lost in Space, the TV series. Most of you are probably familiar, especially Richard, with the classic cover for number 12, by Dave Stevens, which features Crossfire uh, over a dead Marilyn Monroe in her bed. But I'm telling you guys, the entire series is just fantastic. Like I said, I'm rereading it right now. 
Uh, it ran 26 issues, and near the end, they basically ditched all the superhero trappings, and it's about Jay Endicott's adventures in Hollywood. He's wearing plain clothes, and it's great. Uh, Mark Evanier, every issue has a little two- or three-page essay about his experience in Hollywood where he names names, so it's really good, uh, juicy gossip from the 80s about Hollywood and, and its machinations. Here's the best news of all. Issue 12 is the only issue that people really go for because that Dave Steven cover. So you're, you're going to pay for that one. But you can score the full run, minus number 12, pretty cheaply on eBay. I got issues 1 through 26, including issue 12, two years ago off eBay for $25. And wow. they're, they're, they came in Mylar Snugs, 9698s, all of them. I highly recommend it. It's called Crossfire. It was from Eclipse Comics. Go hunt it down. Yeah, I was a fan of DNA, DNA agents. Yeah. Uh, I did not read this particular, I did not read Crossfire. Um, like a lot of the people, it only exists as issue number 12 for me yep. because of the Dave Stevens cover. Um, you know, perhaps one day I'll go back and, and read it. Rainbow from DNA agents plays a, a big role in the early issues. She's in a lot of the early issues. So uh, if you are a DNA agents fan, it's worth it to check it out for that uh, alone. Mm -hmm. All right. You guys have your marching orders. Go get those books. We will catch you next time. Until then, Richard, where should they find us? They can look on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods or the lovely website that John has designed at bronzeandmoderngods.com. It's awful. Please excuse the design. Uh, but we will see you next time. Everybody stay safe.